going to get started here in a second. I know people are still joining audio or joining from our waiting room. So I'll start with my introductions and then hopefully everybody can join by the end of that. So um, welcome. This is a session that is a joint session between iScore RC and the COE Clinical Trials Toolkit Series. So please, if you can, place your full name and email address in the chat box for attendance. We are also offering continuing education credits to attendees, so please indicate CE beside your name and email if you would like continuing education credits. And I can follow up via email after this um, with a continuing education form to be completed and signed. And for those who might also request SOCRA or ACRP credits, um, we are able to share the slides and attendance sheet after this so you can get those credits as well. Um, so now I'll introduce our speaker, Sarah Heyman. Sarah is currently the Assistant Director of Experientials at the iScore RC. She began her career in 2010 as an elementary school teacher. And in 2014, Sarah earned a master's degree in education and obtained a certificate in educational leadership in 2016. In 2019, motivated by her desire to join a team dedicated to improving health outcomes for students affected by health disparities, Sarah joined the West Virginia Clinical and Translational Science Institute as a program coordinator in the Professional Development Corps. By 2020, she advanced to the role of Manager of Professional Development, where she worked closely with early career investigators and directed a summer educational research program for first-year medical students interested in clinical and translational research. Sarah plays a crucial role in shaping the future of education and health research. Her pursuit of a doctorate degree in higher education administration at West Virginia University with a research focus on the impact of professional mentorship demonstrates her commitment to her field. She is expected to graduate in 2026 and further solidifying her position as leader in education and health research. So I'll go ahead and turn it right over to Sarah. And again, if you can put your name and email in the chat um, for attendance purposes, as well as CE credits, that'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thanks, Kylie. I appreciate that introduction. Um, so as you can see on the first slide, if it's possible, uh, turn your cameras on to foster engagement. Um, that's very much appreciated. Also, I just want to mention the chat features that you can use to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, there are reactions that you can use um, also to show support. You know, please raise your hand, unmute yourself if you have a comment or a question, and we'll be sure to um, check the chat box for those things as well. All right, so as Kylie mentioned, um, this session today is called Confidence in Action, Elevating Your Role as a Clinical Research Coordinator. This is going to be an interactive session, so uh, we do have some case studies, or at least one case study, and some activities that we're going to engage in throughout the session. Uh, thank you all for joining with us today, and um, as I said, feel free to raise your hand or unmute, unmute yourself if you have questions or comments throughout. All right, so um, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be doing, uh, of course, introductions, which we've done a little bit of already. Uh, we're going to talk about cultivating that confident mindset. Um, we do have one case study that we're going to go through. And then we're going to talk about um, effective communication and asserting your expertise and then handling challenges and really resilience. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. All right, so the objective today is really enhancing your confidence and impact as a clinical research coordinator. Um, I also provide some mentee training in, in our last few sessions. This is something that's come up a few times as something that clinical research coordinators are really um, hoping to gain through the I4RC program and building their confidence as clinical research coordinators. So I think that this will lend itself well, hopefully, to that, um, that objective. So as I mentioned, we're going to talk about cultivating that confident mindset. Um, we're going to talk about some effective communication strategies, how you can assert your expertise, because you are the experts in um, the clinical trials that you manage. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how to assert that expertise and then um, building some resilience and handling challenges that you might encounter. So first of all, what is that the importance of confidence? Um, confidence is really that self-assurance in your abilities and decisions. Um, it can improve your decision-making and collaboration and really enhance participation trust. There are some statistics that show from literature that state that confident CRCs show higher rates of career satisfaction, career engagement, and competence. So it's really, really important um, for your career that you have that confidence and strategies to really increase your confidence for this impact on your role. 
So the first thing you need to do is recognize where this self-doubt comes from. There are some common triggers and some internal dialogue that can really hinder your confidence. And so the first step is really to recognize that. So things like negative self-talk. This is that internal dialogue that focuses on your shortcomings, saying things like, oh, I can't do this, or I'll never understand. Or maybe you think there's somebody else that would be better equipped to handle it. Um, particularly for clinical research coordinators, I think sometimes when you have to have conversations with PIs, you think, why would I you know, be able to make a judgment on this better than they would? Um, also, there's that comparison to others. So comparing yourself to someone with more experience, another colleague that maybe has been in the, the field longer, or again, um, the PI on the study. Maybe you have had a negative past experience. Maybe you've made a mistake in the past and you have fear of repeating that same mistake. And so that's another trigger that can really um, bring out your, your self-doubt. Also, uh, maybe you've received feedback from stakeholders in the past that's been critical, maybe from sponsors, um, investigators, team members, and that really has undermined your confidence, and that's a, a trigger point for you as well. Um, time constraints, we know with uh, clinical trials, there are pressure to meet deadlines, and that can create undue stress and uncertainty. So recognizing that that is a trigger for self-doubt as well. And then maybe you're handling a complex protocol, and those intricate study protocols can lead to um, uncertainty about your understanding. And so I think, you know, kind of the first step is recognizing that there are triggers for your self-doubt, and then we're going to talk about some strategies to help you move past these. So how do we overcome this self-doubt and uh, cultivate this confident mindset? And so I think that it starts with authenticity. You know, people are drawn to and influenced by people who communicate authentically, easily, and effectively. Um, and that's really that state of being attuned to and able to comfortably express our thoughts, feelings, values, and potential. Um, there's an author, Alyssa Austin. She's the author of 35 Days of Confidence and the founder of Poised and Professional. And she says that confidence is a learned skill and it can be improved. I think a lot of times we think that, you know, you're either confident or, or you're not. And I can assure you that um, this is definitely a skill that you can work through. And there are some strategies to help you do that. Um, it really stems from believing in and trusting yourself. Um, if you don't trust yourself, how is anybody else going to? And I think that really comes across in conversations. If you don't have that confidence, people are going to recognize that and think, well, if they don't think they can do that, why would I think they could? So that's that's really um an important thing to think about. This author also just suggests that confidence comes from, you know, really using those talents and gifts um, and doing work that fulfills you, but you have to know your true authentic self to do that. So really taking time to discover what makes you happy and is important to you is, is very important. So let's think about some strategies to achieve this confident mindset. Um, really, as I mentioned, being your authentic self is really important. Thinking about creating a why of being a clinical research coordinator. Maybe it's because research has helped someone close to you, or maybe you have a loved one who depends on it, you know, depends on a clinical trial. Really try to make it personal um, and really understand why, why is it that I'm in this field. Um, challenge the negative thoughts that you have. Break the cycle of thoughts saying you can't do something. Um, if you have an important conversation coming up with a stakeholder, create a dialogue of what you'll be able to convey to them, you know, kind of prepare ahead of time and I'm jumping ahead because that's one of my next next ones. But thinking about, you know, how am I going to challenge these negative thoughts and, you know, make it through this conversation? Um, setting achievable goals. If you have a deadline, think about breaking it into smaller, more manageable steps to reduce that overwhelming feeling um, that can come with, with deadlines. Uh, preparing for challenges so you're confident, confident in your expertise. This is probably, for myself, um, the biggest thing is preparation. So a year, year and a half ago, giving a presentation for 40 to 50 people, I would have been highly um, stressed and nervous and probably not appear uh, totally confident. But preparation is really something that's helped me is just, you know, being prepared, practicing, practicing in front of your computer, in front of a mirror, whatever it might be. Um, if you have a conversation coming up, like I'd said, writing out the dialogue and really rehearsing that with yourself or with a colleague that you can trust that, you know, can help you with that. And then the last thing I want to say is really celebrate your success. Keep track of the things that 
go well for you. Um, you can take some time to self-reflect, keep a journal, and then revisit those things often. So that kind of reminds yourself, hey, I've been in this situation before. I've done this well, and, um, you know, I can do it again. So we do have a case study that I want to look at, and this is called Overcoming Self-Doubt. And here in just a moment, um, Debbie Lee, who's here with me today, is going to place this in the chat box. And some instructions for when you go into your breakout rooms. Um, you're going to be in groups of three to five people. And they're, they're going to be four people in each room. And I'm going to ask that a volunteer within your groups reads aloud the case study, Overcoming Self-Doubt. Um, again, these are going to be in the chat box. And then within your group, if one person could be the facilitator, so really help ensure that everyone has a chance to share, um, a note taker, so somebody who will jot down, you know, one or two things to report back when we come to the large group, and then a timekeeper, so somebody that really can um, watch for the one minute warning that you're going to get to ensure that everyone has that chance to talk and you come back at, at the correct time. So, so there are some guiding questions on the, the case study that you're going to see, and so that should lead your discussion within your group. And then once we come back, we're going to hopefully each group have you know, one or two thoughts to share from your discussions. So are there any questions about um, the case study? And, um, I'm just going to go around from, for the different groups and see if you have one or two comments you want to make, whether it be from the guiding questions or thoughts that came about as your group discussed. So um, group one, I think this was Laurie, Britt, and Alejandro. Yeah, so... Um, for the first question, um, have you experienced self-doubt in your role and situations that created self-doubt for the members of our group were working with unfamiliar PIs um, or being unsure how you can handle situations that are brand new you haven't experienced before? Um, or sometimes different departments can be challenging to work in, such as an ICU, which is um, the staff can be intense, the patients are really sick, and so you have to find how you fit into that department um, without um, creating any waves in, in an already really busy, intense environment. Um, and then um, as a one of our group members was a CRA, and she said sometimes she's nervous when she has to talk to PIs due to um, gaps in um, knowledge bases. A PI has all this medical knowledge that a CRA wouldn't have. So sometimes that will affect your, um, or create a little bit of self-doubt. Um, for number two, the question, what strategies we chose? Uh, first of all, mentorship. Um, that's really important to have a mentor help to guide you or um, give you um, um support um, in going into situations that are unfamiliar or tackling protocols that have a lot of um, depth to them that you might need a little bit of mentoring for medical knowledge to be able to execute it correctly. Um, and then affirmation was another one we thought would be really important. Um, for number three, um, who can you turn to for mentorship or support in your professional journey? Um, we chose your clinical coordinator or your PI, and um, how can you strengthen these relationships just through really good communication with them um, and setting up um, and prioritizing time to meet um, that is um, dedicated time for the conduct of that protocol. Um, and then number four, what are your three top strengths as a clinical research coordinator and how can you leverage these strengths to build your confidence? So we picked um, leadership, communication skills, and attention to details um, because these are all things that um, give you the confidence and the ability to know that what you're talking about when you have to be part of the team that's um, coordinating a study. And then for five, how do you think a positive mindset can influence your performance in high pressure situations? And Nikki put it very good. Um, positive energy, or Britt put it very good, sorry. Positive energy attracts positive energy. That's what's our number five answer. 
Thank you, group one. Um, our next group was Chloe, Deb, and Erica. Any other comments or thoughts you want to add um, based on this case study and the questions that were provided? Not. Um, we can move to our next group, which was Carrie and Ida. I'm sorry, I couldn't get my my unmute oh, off. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been there. So I I agreed with everything that she just said. And have you ever experienced self doubt? I'd say every trial, because they're all so unique. And you really don't know what you're getting into until you get in. Um, and the, um, the level of education, I mean, we all feel like a doctor, you know, obviously knows everything, but then you find out that they, they know everything about their specialty and that's not research typically. So you become the specialist, which gives you more confidence in organizing, communicating with people. Uh, communicating is huge. Just to get uh, accurate information, to engage people, to share the information that needs to be shared um, confidently. Absolutely. I think I keep hearing the theme of communication, which is what we're going to talk about next um, for sure, and some strategies to really implement effective communication of CRCs. All right, anything else from that group? All right, we'll go to, I think it was Carrie and um, Ida. Yes, it's E-Day. Um, I apologize. No, no, no worries, no worries. So for question one, have you experienced self-doubt in your role? We both said yes. We're both new to our roles, fairly new. So um, absolutely. <laughs> and what specific situations triggered this? I think it's um, obviously being new to a role, the, the learning curve. Uh, and number two, which of the strategies resonate with you? Carrie and I both said um, mentorship and um, how we can implement these strategies, this, you know, seeking out mentorship is seeking our colleagues when we have questions, putting our pride aside, not being afraid to ask questions. Um, and for three, who can you turn to for mentorship or support? Uh, I'm fortunate at the site that uh, where I am, we have lead clinical research coordinators, um, three of them that we can reach out to who also are supporting us through the i -Score program. Um, and Carrie also similarly said, you know, she has colleagues who are CRCs with more experience that she can turn to. Um, for four, what are your top three strengths? As a CRC, we kind of collabed on this and said um, organization, integrity, and uh, collaboration were our three. And then for five, how do you think a positive mindset can influence your performance in high pressure situations? When you're positive, you can think more clearly um, and efficiently. So uh, it's important to maintain a positive attitude for that reason. And that was what we had. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I of appreciate it. And let's see, we've got, um, we, we have a lot of groups. So I want to move through these and have everyone give everyone the opportunity to speak. Um, so as we go through, think about some things, if you have anything that hasn't been mentioned yet or something, a really big takeaway that you had from, from this case study. So I think we've got Fiona, Helen, and Jackie next. What was our next group? Um, I guess I'll just say that we agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, and um, for the strengths, I think we all said the same kind of thing, ask questions, curiosity. And, and the last thing was patience, you know, when you're training others as well. Um, and let's see the question. Number one, there were a couple of us that were new to the job. So that's part of the whole, you know, experiencing self-doubt. Um, 
I think that sums up what wasn't said, unless Fiona or Jackie have something else. I didn't write it. This is just off my head. <laughs> Thank you, Helen. You're welcome. Great. Um, Jen, Jennifer, and Liz Marie. Any other thoughts or comments? Hi. Um, we just discussed the pretty much the same uh, sort of situations. And um, even if you are well seasoned as a research coordinator, you can learn things from the, the new people that come in and um, get a different perspective because sometimes we get um, stalled in what we're used to doing and the new insight helps us to, to see things uh, a little better. Yeah, absolutely. I like that, that take on it as well, because there's definitely that um, learning from one another. And I, I think we've had a few actually preceptors who have said to us, this has been really great for us too, as preceptors, because we're reviewing things that we hadn't uh, thought about in a while, not that they don't do them on a regular, but um, just kind of having that awareness brought back. That's that's great. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see here. I've got Jamie and Kelsey, I believe, and Ketley. Hi, Jamie. Um, yeah, we really express the same sentiments, like that we've heard all the same themes for all of these questions. And you know, I think building, one thing we talked about was, you know, building relationships is a really important strength to have in this field, whether it's with your PIs, participants, sponsors, peers. Um, I, I find that very, extremely valuable. For the, yeah, an, another topic was the positive mindset. And, you know, Christy did mention, and, and I agree, is it does help you think more clearly and stay more calm and focused. But I think it also gives you the attitude where you're not as hard on yourself. So when it, it, it plays a role in the self-doubt. So the more mm -hmm. positive you are, you may have a, a more positive perspective um, in situations. All right, thank you, Jamie. Um, we have a few more groups. Um, I wanna open it up because I, I do wanna make sure that we get through um, the rest of the, today's session. but. Um, any last minute thoughts from groups seven, eight, or nine? I know we've got um, Layla and Kim and Michelle, Brill, Sarah, Savannah. I just want to open it up to the group and see what last thoughts or comments we have about the case study. And please feel free to unmute yourselves um, or use the chat box as well. Sarah, from our group, and sort of the flip side of the conversation, the comment that was just made, the the statement was made that it was easy to focus on the weaknesses, but much more helpful to remember to focus on and build on your strengths. Yeah, absolutely. And and it is always so much easier to focus on your weakness, but trying to shift that mindset to um, the positives, and I think that's where some of that journaling, which is something that I maybe wouldn't have thought of before, you know, journaling and then going back and reviewing the success you've had in the past um, can be really helpful. All right. Anybody else? All right. So as I mentioned, we're going to move forward into um, effective communication. And so the key components that we're really going to focus on today are um, we're going to talk about clear and concise messaging, and I think that's come up a little bit in some of your comments. Um, active listening, which is very important, and then also some nonverbal cues. So communication is more than just what we say. It's how we say, you know, that inflection in our voices, the tones we use, um, some nonverbal cues that we might uh, give. And it's also with whom. Um, know who your audience is. Are you speaking to a patient? Are you speaking to a PI, a colleague, a sponsor? And think about how your communication may shift um, dependent on who you're talking to. And then you should also um, keep in mind when and where and what context or what environment are you communicating? You know, if it's within your office with your colleagues, it might be a little bit different than if you're communicating with a PI or a sponsor. Um, and then also thinking about the why. What are the goals and objectives of your conversation? Um, and not only for yourself, but also for as the receiver as well. And really keeping in mind, um, 
you know, sometimes what you might want to talk about might be a difficult conversation, but keeping, you know, the ultimate goal in mind, whether it's the patient care or the protocol and what is expected in that protocol and really trying to remind yourself that, yes, this is a difficult conversation. I'm not sure how to communicate this, but um, really the end goal in mind at all times. And this is really essentially interweaving that emotional intelligence into your daily conversations, which is very important to be effectively communicating. So we're gonna do a little exercise and you'll notice um, a sentence that goes on and on the same here. Same words, same meanings, I, I'm not quite so sure. So I'm going to just start with the first one. And what we're gonna look at here, you'll see there's a word that's bolded and that's where we're gonna place our inflection. And I want you to think about what, the, what this implies as it's being read. So this first one I'll do for you and then we might call in some volunteers. So the sentence says, I didn't tell Stephanie you were lazy. What might my inflection imply there? Someone else did. <laughs> well, did, right? <laughs> Wasn't me. Um, do I have somebody that might want to read, read, and you can choose any of these, or the next one, um, and place that inflection on that word didn't. And feel free to just unmute. If not, I can do it. I, I can do it. Sure. I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. I told her other things. <laughs> what does that imply? That might also imply it's not oh, true. I didn't. Yeah. I did tell Elizabeth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the next one. I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. <laughs> I texted her instead. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can see where we place our inflection when we communicate really can change the meaning. And it's it's really important. Sometimes um, it's just important to keep this in mind as you communicate with people. You know, the next one, I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. What might that imply? I told, I told Debbie. Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> I told John or Tom or Carol. The whole office, except for Elizabeth. Yeah. So really how you how you communicate can take on well many different meanings. So it's very important to be careful about that. You know, I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. I said it was Tom. I said Tom was lazy. You know, I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. You still are. <laughs> <laughs> or I didn't tell Elizabeth you were lazy. You're not. Uh, you're just casual about your work. You're not totally lazy, but, you know. So really the power of reflection and the need to be present to detect the nuance is, is highly important when we think about how we're communicating with others. Um, you know, what if I began today and said, so happy to be here today? I mean, what kind of, what would that imply to each of you that it really wasn't, I wasn't happy to be here. I wasn't happy to be doing this, which is not the case. So I think we need to, you need to keep in mind, you know, that positive energy, um, be passionate about what you're saying, upbeat and confident and really composed. And that goes a long way. And it can, you know, make different implications in your um, communication. Another thing I just want to mention is email correspondence. Um, the same thing can happen with an email. So be careful, um, especially if you get an email that maybe fires you up a little bit. Take some time to think about it before you respond. Maybe respond and put it in your um, drafts and revisit it a day later. There's nothing that says we have to respond to an email immediately. Um, one thing that I like to do is if I'm not sure about how an email sounds, um, I look at one of my colleagues and say, hey, can you read this? And just tell me, does this convey what I really want to convey? And I think that that's something with emails is, is easy to do. Um, to send something that maybe doesn't convey exactly what you would hope to convey. So just something to keep in mind. Oh, okay, active listening um, is also really important. Being fully present is important. Listening with your whole being, not just your ears. Um, you know, thinking about things, not looking at your phone, um, observing body language when you're communicating with somebody? What's their body language like as you're speaking to them? What's yours look like as you're speaking with them as well? Um, typically, we're in a, when we're in a conversation, what do we do? What's one thing that we sometimes do when conversing with somebody? Any 
Any ideas? Eye contact. Well, yeah, that is a positive thing for sure. Um, but sometimes do we think about what we're going to say next? And so that makes us seem a little bit disengaged or we're maybe we're missing part of the conversation. So making sure eye contact, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch who said that, but that's one way to show that you are engaged um, with that conversation. Um, there are certain things you can say to show that you're listening. You could say, just a second, um, hold that thought. I want to jot something down and let them know. So if you're writing, they'll know, oh, they're, gonna, they're writing what I'm mentioning and not just something else. Um, okay, you have my full attention. That's something else you can say to make sure that whoever you're communicating with knows that you're paying attention. If you're taking notes on your phone, um, make sure you acknowledge that and tell them that. Because I've seen individuals on their phones thinking they were just texting or sending an email when really they were taking notes about things we were talking about. So you might want to acknowledge that when you do that. Um, model a position of curiosity. You know, say things like, oh, that's fascinating. Or, um, you know, what, what could we do next? And so that really helps to show that you're actively listening and engaged in the conversation. Think about whether we allow enough time to listen. Um, there are some trainings that I'm in where I might ask questions and I provide a wait time and sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, um, but you have to allow some people need a little bit more time to collect their thoughts and what they want to say. So trying to allow for that time to listen and respond is, is something important. Um, and then asking open-ended questions to whoever you're conversing with so they have that opportunity to, you know, uh, reiterate what you've talked about and what they've learned. Any other thoughts about active listening that maybe I didn't mention? I, I think I, not. not uh, oops, that's really No, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think um, not interrupting their conversation, let them say the whole piece of what they have to say before you respond to any part of it? Absolutely. Because one, if you're not allowing them to think, complete their thought, um, you might be missing something very important and making an implication that's not correct until you've heard the whole, the whole piece. And when you're um, provided with feedback, you know, one thing to keep in mind is not to take it personally. Um, try not to get emotional, you know, kind of tuck that emotion away to keep the objectives of that communication in mind. Um, as I just mentioned on the slide before, is really knowing your purpose for the conversation and try not to get um, your own emotions involved. And that's hard sometimes. You know, nonverbal cues, if you look at this image here, um, if you're positioning yourself like the first or second, you might look disengaged or shy and nervous. You know, our bodies really shape our minds. As this quote says, our minds shape our behavior and our behavior shapes our outcome. Um, when we feel powerless, our body language shrinks. When we feel powerful, it expands. Have you ever heard of um, individuals before they give a presentation taking the Superman or super, Superwoman stance? It sounds... Um, a little bit corny maybe, but I won't lie. I have used that before myself because there's something about holding yourself in that power position um, to build your confidence and help you in those communication as you um, go into conversations or communications with others. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is asserting your expertise. Um, you are or will become the expert on the clinical trials you're assigned to. That's just, you have to understand and recognize your value. Um, there's an article um, from the Open Access Journal of Clinical Trials that says centers with clinical research coordinators are better organized, um, achieve faster recruitment, and demonstrate an elevated sense of patient care. That, that should indicate that, to you that your work and input is extremely needed and valuable. So some things um, that you can do for tips for really putting forth your assertiveness. One is to use I statements, which we're gonna practice here in a moment, and then really communicating clearly your thoughts and your needs. Um, but the first is to recognize and articulate your contributions. Each of you has the contributions needed for the, the trials that you're assigned to. 
And so just recognizing that value that you bring. So when we think about I statements, um, they reflect our inner thoughts and feelings. It focuses on the feelings and opinions of the speaker, which allows for a conversation to feel less confrontational. So I'm gonna read aloud this scenario, and then um, we're gonna look at the example of how they use I statements to respond. So it says a clinical research coordinator is in a meeting with the principal investigator to discuss recent changes to the study protocol that the CRC feels are affecting patient recruit participant recruitment. The PI has implemented new procedures that the CRC believes are overly complicated and may discourage potential participants. The CRC needs to communicate their concerns assertively. Now, this can seem pretty daunting to have to go to a PI and say, ooh, I don't think this is going to work. But if you look at how the response is below, um, it makes it a less confrontational response. So it says, I've, re I've noticed that the recent changes to the protocol have made the recruitment process more challenging. I feel that the additional steps could lead to potential participants feeling overwhelmed. I want to ensure we meet our recruitment goals while maintaining a positive experience for the participants. Can we discuss how we might simplify these changes or provide additional support to our recruitment team? So you see how the difference is, um, you know, had the, the CRC gone and said, oh, those changes that you made to the protocol made it a lot more challenging. Uh, you, should, you should really think about those additional steps that, you know, you've added that could really make them feel overwhelmed. There's a difference in placing the blame on or saying, These, I think that we could do something to improve this. So does that make, does that make sense? The ownership piece of things. Yeah, absolutely, the ownership. So what we're going to do is I have a scenario here that I'm going to read, and I'm just going to ask for volunteers to think about some I statement responses that you could use in this scenario. So clinical research coordinator meets with the principal investigator to discuss the timelines for upcoming study milestones, which the CRC believes are unrealistic. The PI has set ambitious deadlines for data collection and analysis. But the CRC feels that these timelines may compromise the quality of the research due to the tight schedule. The CRC needs to assertively express their concerns. So I'm going to give you just a moment or two to think about one or two I statements that you could offer um, in a response to this. And please feel free to use the chat box or just unmute, raise your hand. Um, I think I would say something like, uh, I'm concerned about uh, these timelines don't, I'm not sure if we'll be able to meet them. Um, and we want to have the best data, accurate data, etc. Yeah, that's a great, that great one. I'm concerned um, that we're not going to be able to meet the deadlines. I think appealing to their, like, I know the scientific integrity of the data is of the utmost importance, and I feel as though kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I'm concerned, you know, that rushing through this process could impact that scientific integrity or the study's integrity. Yes. Uh, there's one in the chat. I feel that the timeline may compromise the quality of the research due to the tight schedule. Britt said, thank you, Britt. Yeah, so you can you see the power of using an I statement um, when practicing your assertiveness? And it, it especially for, I think, new uh, coordinators, it can seem like a daunting thing, but the more you practice this, um, the easier, easier it can get. Any other thoughts or comments? So, um, so what happens when you face challenges related to your work? Um, there are strategies and beliefs to really help you embrace that you can develop resilience. Um, a growth mindset, according to the statement from an NIH Journal of Association for a Psychological Science article, a uh, growth mindset is the belief that human capacities are not fixed but can develop over time. 
Um, and this relates back to that idea that confidence can be learned and improved. So really embracing that growth mindset that, yes, this is where you are today, but you can improve and change that over time and with practice. Um, thinking about developing effective stress management techniques um, for building resilience, um, for maintaining composure. I know that for me, one of the, the things that I struggled with for years was presenting. And so there were times that I felt like I had no control over my body when I went to do it. It was like, I didn't know when it would hit me. I might shake, I might stutter, whatever it might be. So really practicing that mindfulness and breathing exercises, um, thinking about successful outcomes. These are all things that can help you with that. Um, particularly for, you know, going into conversations that you're concerned about or worried about, um, just it's practice, practice and preparation for uh, maintaining that composure. So today, and I think we are just on the top of the hour, um, the key takeaways, confidence is really crucial for effective clinical research coordination, and it can be learned and improved. So if you are just starting and you're feeling that, you know, your confidence needs improvement, it can, it can be. Um, you have the power and expertise to improve outcomes for your teams. Um, just remind yourself that you are a lot of the times the expert on those protocols and those, um, the, the clinical trials that you're assigned to. And then those effective communication strategies are really essential to the role of the CRC. So that is really the conclusion of our session today. I want to thank you um, for being here and for your input. Um, and I want to just leave a few moments if anyone has questions or comments.